Great. Well, I'm joined this afternoon by my old friend, James McIntyre, who has very kindly agreed to talk to me and to do a bit of a review of my new book, The Black Art of Killing. Um, I'm a screenwriter and novelist, and at one time I was a barrister. Um, James has got a very similar background. He was a criminal lawyer in Glasgow. Um, he had a very colourful life in that job. It ended in, in uh, a short spell in prison, which we'll talk about later on. Not short yeah. enough. <laughs> then James became a writer, a screenwriter, a prolific screenwriter. I think you've written about 100 episodes of River City, the Scottish TV show on BBC Scotland. And we met, I think, about 14 years ago. Yeah. Um, must when I, I co-created a show called New Street Law, we needed some writers um because we couldn't write the episodes quickly enough and then the executive producer produced a script that you'd written james and they said um you got to read this this guy sounds really interesting he was a lawyer and then he went to prison um for guns or something like that and i thought oh my god who the hell is this and um so <laughs> no, i read the script it was honestly involved it was pure violence yeah that's right and i thought um well, this guy's going to be a, an angel or a devil. I remember that little phrase going through my head. And um, we've known each other 14 years, and I, I know exactly uh, which you are, James. <laughs> um, so how's, how's it going in lockdown? In, um, you're between Edinburgh and Glasgow, aren't you? Yes, indeed. In, in Linlithgow, everything's fine. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's an, an unusual. I don't think the world will ever be the same again, the way things are going. However, I've been locked up in worse places, yeah, many a time, without without a hot woman like my wife, right, right, hot food and Netflix. So things could be a lot worse. So it's all cool for you there, yeah. Well, we're just it's it's me, and my wife, and my very bored twenty one year old son whose university education has had to stop, and he's he's the one who's climbing the walls. I don't blame him. I have a I have a twenty sorry a thirty year old. Um, Son, who's in the film business, in the in the business, right, right. And he's a cameraman, who's done done a lot of stuff, um, Outlanders, Shet um, Shetland, Kayad Kanye West. How you pronounce it, Kanye West? Kanye. Kanye, is it? I don't know. Some talentless guy, anyway. Um, he did his video, various stuff. But he's, of course, in lockdown now as well. That the, the mm. world is down to a halt. The film the film world. Yeah. Uh, but my other son as well. He's a graphic designer. He's locked down with us as well but my yeah. daughter she's in her own house with my grandson and her partner but she's going back to the front next week because she's a nurse so yeah she's going back to help out well we'd be saying prayers for her to be safe thank That's you ter terrific job she's going to be doing yes she's a um, she's a um, she's a good girl she's a good girl so look, this, this book, you've read it in about three days flat. I'm so grateful to you. There it is. Yep. Two days. Um, two, two days. days. Wow. Okay. I couldn't, I couldn't put it down. People say that all the time about books, couldn't put it down. But I found, I, I really enjoyed it very much. It took me about um, 10 years from the very first conception of that character to getting it in print. Um, so it feels like the end of a very long road for me. So. You know, when, when you hand it over to friends or people you don't know to read it, it's not that you fear the judgment. It's it's like you really want to know whether you've spent your time wisely or not. Well, I certainly think you have. I noticed at the very end, and I'm not talking about the end of the book, no spoilers. I'm talking about the acknowledgements. You wrote that the character was originally, this, this amused me, hmm. um, and it struck home, a character conceived for television that you'd pitched a version a few times and was met with the smiles and rejections that our screenwriters never get used to. And um, how true that is. How true that, in anything, um, ever, in my view, anything ever approaching very good never gets made. It's got to fit within certain um, parameters. And uh, Well, uh, you, you and I are fans of, uh, before we get onto the book, we're fans of The Sopranos, yes. Breaking Bad, those really uncompromising shows that go into the darkest aspects of human nature. 
And we know that on British television, it has been virtually impossible to get anything like that. Off oh, the absolutely. absolutely. And I tried to get something called Jimmy Two Guns, which is the name of our book, which we'll talk about another time yeah. for, for years, along with yourself. Yeah. And, and so far, nothing. I was looking at the, just as it happens while I was waiting to speak to you today, I was looking at um, God, the Godfather, the great film, the Godfather. And apparently, I mean, it just goes to show that it happens to everyone. Uh, Coppola was on the verge of being fired every single day of the shoot. Hmm. They didn't want Pacino to play the part, and he was brilliant. They wanted Ryan O'Neill. I can't think of anybody less Italian looking hmm. or less of a gangster or somebody else. Um, they, they, they wanted anybody except Brando to play the Godfather. Anybody. Oh, wow. okay. And the music, you remember the music at the wedding at the beginning? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 um, the studio hated the music. They wanted it out. And it was only because of the fact that they played it to uh, an audience, you know, to, 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 for their opinion, they loved it. So mm -hmm. everything that they hated about it made it the great film it was. And to me, that's exactly TV for you, although this was film. You know, they, anything yeah. that was good or is good, or is going to be great, and they crush it. However, well, this, yeah, this is the problem we wrestle with in creativity, which is that the people that control the money, that commission the stuff, commission on the basis of what's worked in the past. So when you come with something new that's breaking the mold, um, it's always going to be a massive challenge. And our, our great unproduced script, the Jimmy Two Guns script, it will, we'll make it one day. We'll get it to the screen, but <laughs> hopefully, hopefully while we're still alive. Well, anyway. hopefully, yeah. The real Jimmy Two Guns is coming out in, God willing, in August, the book, the real thing, um, at least book one, but um, God willing. Wait. But as far as the, the scripts, the films, the TV series is concerned, I don't know what will happen. We'll just have to keep praying. Yeah, I, I've, got, I've got high hopes for the TV business because the British TV business now has to compete directly with the streaming services. And... Um, we can't mess about doing half-baked television anymore. It's got to be full-throated, full-strength stuff. That's what people are used to. That's what they want. Anyway, that's a discussion for uh, yep, another good. chat. Um, so tell me what you thought of this this book. I, 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 I mean, people are going to think I'm just saying this. And people are going to think I'm just saying that I'm just saying this. But the... Um, I really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed it because it did all the things which we've just discussed that TV doesn't do, and also what a great deal of books don't do. And also, the book itself, um, no spoilers again, but didn't come to a definite conclusion mm, mm. about a question which I don't think anybody will ever come to a definite conclusion about. Um, people will vary on it. I mean, you know, the, the I, I thought the character was a, was a very, you could say he was a very complex character, but at the same time you could say he was an incredibly straightforward character. Well, because, let me just describe who he is. So we, the, yes. the protagonist is Leo Black. He's a guy of about 50. He's been a major in the SAS for 20 years. He's been in the SAS. Um, and when we meet him, he's been out of it for five years and he's trying to become a military historian at Oxford University and become an intellectual. And he's tried to move away from the world of violence and he's tried to take the lessons he's learned in war in order to try and prevent future futile wars. So he's on this sort of positive trajectory and then something happens in his life which puts him right back into the fray again. So he, he's a kind of self-conscious action hero. So he's, he's someone that has to go and be in really tough situations and even kill, but aware of what he's doing and very self-aware very self about, what, about that. Um, so I'm interested in what you, what you made of him, you know, the, the essence of his character. I, I, I thought his character, as I say, was he was a man who was obviously thinking about his past, thinking about changing, and whether, but then also, you know, whether he needed to change. 
and why he was changing. Was he changing in order to please other people, to advance a different career, which he did, an academic career, which he'd, uh, he then started upon. I said, I don't want to give away any, any spoilers for people who will doubtless buy the book. Um, it's, it's whether or not he wanted to change for himself or wanted to change for others. But what I liked about it was its, you know, its truthfulness. It was the, the book, if you, if, I don't know if you remember the film, A Few Good Men. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, Tom Cruise uh, and Jack Nicholson. Hmm. Uh, I think I must have been one of a, a small minority, uh, um, I don't know if you'd include yourself in it or not, who actually felt sorry for Jack Nicholson at the end of that film because he, he, he talks very much about um, the world being safe, the country being safe because people are prepared um, to put themselves in positions of danger mm. to keep the country safe. And yet, of course, the film comes out as it has to, you know, he gets locked up, but taken away in disgrace and Tom Cruise, you know, that uh, the Tom Cruise is the hero, you know, he's managed to get this person locked up. Yeah. But, yeah. And, and to me, it, 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 he, to me, Nicholson uh, represented the truth, or the, the, the reality rather, reality, maybe the reality and truth are different things, but the reality of the situation. And then um, Tom Cruise was, it was, I, I thought his whole part was rather naive, to be quite honest. Yeah, well this, this character Leo Black, right, he comes from the fact that I grew up in Hereford and I still live in Herefordshire, um, which is where the SAS are based, right? So some of my friends at school had dads in the SAS or had just left. And what I noticed about these guys was that they were very calm, um, mild-mannered, softly spoken. Um, there was nothing flashy about them. They tended to be quite short, like me, about five foot seven, quite stocky, but not, you know, kind of muscle-bound guys. Um, and they led ordinary family lives. And then at a the drop of a hat, they'd have to go off somewhere and presumably be involved in something very violent indeed, because the SAS are the people you send in to round people up and kill them. Um, and it was that duality in their characters which fascinated me. You know, they are the people who are like the, the guards on the perimeter of our very liberal society. So we've got a university in this book where people are discussing philosophical ideas and, and it's the environment where, you know, topics like microaggressions have come from. But yet all of that is protected by people who are prepared to go out with a gun and, and kill people. Um, I thought that, you know, with your background as a, as a criminal lawyer, you might kind of relate to characters like that, who've got that dual aspect. I do. I, I, and I mean, I know, um, how could I say it? I mean, I know people, I know and I've acted for people who have allegedly killed people. Um, and I know people from from this let's call it the underworld mm. and one of my um in, in in i think in in a treatment i wrote for, wrote for jimmy two guns i wrote killers take their kids to crash and mobsters have mortgages to pay mm. people have because you know, people don't sit around being gangsters in their living room you know that the, the, what they do is the, 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 you know the, the, the famous line in in the um, and Godfather, was it Godfather one when uh, um, Michael Collins says to Sonny, it's nothing personal, Sonny, it's strictly business. Mm. And whilst you immediately think, oh, well, these are criminals, uh, so we don't really care why they are doing it, but they, they don't really care if you care. Um, their business is their business. And when they take a life, it's normally within the confines or within the, um, you know, the group of people in their world mm. in the same way as when an SAS officer takes out some, somebody in Libya or somebody in, somebody in, somebody in uh, Palestine or something like that who takes them out. He's not taking out some, you know, some housewife who's sitting doing a knitting or something like that. He's taking out his, his, um, his equal or somebody like him mm. at least from the same in that, in that same group, 
who's, who's chosen that same life. Mm-hmm. Gangsters don't go around shooting old grannies, you know. The kind of the kind of person who I think has regrets about what they've done are the people who have, on the spur of the moment, maybe killed their wife because she's been unfaithful, or they've done something in a fit of temper or in a fit of under drugs or under drink, and then that would haunt them for the rest of their lives, even if they've done it by accident, like somebody who kills a child by running over them, you know, yeah. take the taking of a human life. But I think when you, I think the type of person that Leo Black is, the type of people that the SES are, and the type type of people who are, if you want to call them, hitmen in the underworld, are the same sort of person. I don't think they go back home and start thinking about it. I think right, they, yeah, well, that's the interesting thing because when I when I used to meet guys in the SES, I was slightly frightened of them. You know, the fear is that here's someone who's a killer in their day job and that um, they might, you know, I suppose your imagination plays tricks. They might suddenly jump up and, you know, put their hands around your throat. Well, that's that's never going to happen. No. And, and that's, the, that's the interesting thing about them. And also, I've got to, to know a couple of guys recently about my age or a bit older who've been in that world most of their working lives. Um, they seem very well adjusted. They don't suffer from post-traumatic stress, and it all—it it seems to be almost a characteristic of people in the special forces when they select them. They select out those people that are psych- at all psychologically vulnerable, and so what they end up with is people who, I suppose you might call them kind of sociopathic. You—you you probably could do a psychological diagnosis of most most of them, but they don't. Um, I spoke to one guy, I said, what's, what's it like to be in a job where you have to kill people? He just said, well, it's just a job, you know, sometimes there are bodies lying around, but it's just a job. Yeah. Um, you or I would find that very difficult to wrap our heads around, but there are people like that who exist, who always have existed, and he probably always will, I think. Yeah, that, that's, that's correct. And I think also it's very easy to go back, talking to, back to, the, to, to my... To, to equating with the underworld it's very easy to say ah but these people are criminals well what are the SAS doing you know I mean it's what they are doing right it's a job it's it's um they're, they're not being orders and you know when when they take somebody out when they kill somebody or put them to bed I think it's a phrase that they use when they put someone to bed that person may well have a wife and a family and a mother and a father and cousins and the family may well, you know, be living on that person's pay. They will, you know, they, they may go into poverty. All sorts of mm. outcomes may be, but that doesn't, that doesn't concern them. They are doing what they're told to do. And I don't think, and it comes out in your book, your, your, your character at one stage says this. He never ever thinks he's doing it for justice or for right, he's doing it because he's been ordered to do it, and that's what he does. Yeah, that's right. And then when he's when he's in the fray, when he's in the thick of things, it's all about survival, just whatever it takes to survive. And that requires him to be very, very brutal at times. Um, and that, for me, was almost the difference. I could, I could write that in a novel but if I try to do that in television, I think the commission executives would get very nervous about that. You know, um, about, about a hero who is who's who's both someone we're meant to sympathise with on many levels, but who can also kill in cold blood and even torture people when he has to. Um, well, they would, they would, they wouldn't because of the fact they think it reflects on themselves. They're they're scared in my humble submission, they're scared to put forward a character or to have anything to do with the production of a programme which will portray a character who is prepared to do these things for fear that it will reflect on themselves that they accept that there are people like that and that that their acceptance may in some way be validation or condoning that sort of thing. And to, to me, what your book and the, the great thing about your book, one of the many good things, is that you're, it's not about condoning 
And it's not about condemning. It's about stating the fact. Yeah. It's about stating the fact. That also, I think there's a certain amount of, what you talked about, the, the, the makeup of these people. There's a certain amount of um, almost dark, sort of cynical thinking. I, without giving any names away at all, I was once acting for a person who um, was charged with uh, killing another person in a gangland setting. Mm. And then... Um, whether or not um, the, pe the person was acquitted of it, but whether or not he did it is another question, which obviously goes with me to the grave. But he was lying in a cell, and the policeman inspector over opened the door and said something along the lines of, it's a lovely day outside. He was just taunting him. Mm -hmm. It's a lovely day outside. It's a pity you're banged up until court on Monday and can't get any exercise. To which he replied, oh, it's okay, this is only exercise I need. <laughs> and it's that he, you know, as if to pull a trigger. And the policeman was just slammed the door and went away. And to me, that's not somebody who's busy repenting of too much. Mm -hmm. yeah, to repent of or not is a different story. But, and I, I can see that um, Major Leo Black being in a cell or being locked up by some other government, you know, Libya or Saudi Arabia somewhere, being taunted and coming back with that sort of, it's not just a bravado, mm. it's almost, a, it's almost a, a complete acceptance of the situation. You yeah. know, it's not being big, it's not being clever, it's not being, well, it is clever, it is being big, but it's not that in its essence. It's an, it's an, it's an automatic response this, this was, if I had an Im impulse, you know, it's very hard as a writer to sort of analyse your own motivations. But if I had an impulse in this book, it was I, I wanted a character who was prepared to, to uh, face the darkest aspects of himself um, fearlessly. And, you know, if you, if you know anything about psychotherapy or the writings of Carl Jung, you know, um, we've all got this this shadow side of us, you know, this better than most of us, James, and um, you have to explore it and sort of own it in some way in order to become a, a, a whole human being. And this, for me, was the great success of The Sopranos and Breaking Bad, because those were shows in which you had heroes who did just that. They went down into the deepest, deepest, darkest recesses of their psyches and they confronted it and they sort of owned it yes um, and i think what was also interesting about the sopranos was that the, the lack of violence that the show actually contained people were very very interested in the in as you put in the book in the fact that you know tony was a dad you know, um, he, yes, he had affairs with various women, which meant nothing to him. He, you know, he cared about his children. He, he had all the values which you or I or any other right-minded person would have. You know, he cared. I mean, he cared about his mother to an extent where many, many a non-gangster would have given up. Yeah, you know, yeah. when she was continually rude to him, and uh, you know when he brought her, remember he, he brought her some, I think macaroons one day, and she told him to where to put them, basically, and he brought her CDs, and he brought her all sorts of stuff, and she was she was rude to him, nasty to him, and yet he he, she, and in fact she had to try to have him clipped at the end of the day, and he yeah. still, you know, he still needed, he wanted to love her, mm. and and when his son ventured slightly into that world he was really upset about it and he was you know and to me i think what, what the public liked to see and what what made it such a great success was that he could go from that into when he went along with poopy bump and Cero and they killed matthew bavalequa i can't remember Bavalek or something like that they, 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 they tie him to a chair yeah Tony says to him, are you sure that's the, you know, you sure you don't want a, a Coke or something with sugar in it? 
because mm. that's, that's the last motherfucking drink you're ever, sure this drink you're ever going to have. And then they pump him full of lead as he's screaming for his mother. Mm. Mm. Like a child. Mm. So you can go from the man who loves his children and kisses them goodnight to the man who's taking another. But you must remember that that other man, the, the, the man he killed, Bevilacqua, had ventured into his life. Mm, mm. in the same way as the people that Leo takes out have ventured into his life. Yeah, that's right. But he... he these characters... Exp I mean, it's an idea that we we discussed a lot back when we were writing New Street Law over 10 years ago. Yeah. I remember you said something like, oh, sometimes you've got to be bad to be good. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you've got to break the rules. Sometimes you have to be violent. Sometimes you have to do something which in any other circumstances would be morally unacceptable in order to achieve the right result. Yes. Um, and, you know, this is hard for us to, to square, you know, this kind of secular morality we've been busy trying to construct in the last few decades is all about eliminating anything from the dark side of human nature, uh, from our interactions with each other. It doesn't seem to me to work at all. No. I mean, um, you know, the, 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 um, the safer society becomes, the more we pretend that we don't have any violent impulses, um, the more violent the fiction is that we want to consume, you know, and, and the more we want our stories to take us deep, deep, deep into that, those dark recesses. Um, anyway, but this, um, you and I were talking yesterday about um, how the, the, some of the decisions that soldiers have to make the kind of the, the difficult moral calls they have to make a, a bit similar to how lawyers have to make decisions. Um, yes. Just before we go on to that, the, 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 when I said to you about doing doing bad to do good, you've got an excellent line, and I wish I could remember which, and I took a note of it, now I can't remember it, but an excellent line in the book where he's where Leo says, or what it said, that sometimes in order to live, You've got to be colder than cold, even deader than death. Yeah, which I thought was exactly right. You know that the, um, I think there's, I think we've, we've, and it's just as you said, we, 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 we've got to a stage now where call, and calling somebody, calling a man he, and I'm not going to go down this road, Matthew. So don't worry, I'm not going to go up a tangent. The, the calling a man he who wants to declare himself as being a woman, fair enough is somehow assaulting him or, or, or being violent towards him or calling a woman she who wants to be identified as a man is somehow, you know, in somehow attacking them. Well, we've got to the stage where unless you call them Z or Zim or something utterly ridiculous, unless we go down that route, then, you know, my mother, my 95-year-old mother would be classed as being aggressive. Mm -hmm. And yet, as you see, the television, well, not the television, unfortunately, but the, the stuff that's made, and especially the, 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 the games which are made, the children use, you know, on the PlayStations and all these things and then all the new stuff, are incredibly violent, mm -hmm. incredibly violent, and, and, and even turning towards some of them to, to, in sexual violence in some of them uh, now. But anyway, sorry. You were... Yeah, well, that, that's, that's because we've tried to edit that shadow side of existence out of our day-to-day -day lives. So you and I probably grew up um, reading fairy tales that were really quite gruesome and involved children being imprisoned by horrible characters in the woods um, that you wouldn't dare read to kids no. now. But, but the point is you can't avoid that. I mean, that, that is the nature of reality. And we're going through something now with this bizarre lockdown where everybody's suddenly confronted with a kind of mortal peril collectively for the first time in, in decades. And it's quite interesting to see, to see how people react to that. It, it is. It, it's, it's, um, you were, I think, I think you were going to segue into talking about, um, our profession, mm. um, or not our, our, our first profession, the law, you mean? Our first profession, our first, I was going to say our first love. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, hardly, hardly. I, I, I had always wanted to um, be a writer, I may say, and uh, just very quickly. And I told my father that. My father was uh, a man who had um, very humble beginnings and uh, he had paid his own way 
by working on the salmon fishing boats. He paid his own way to university. His parents couldn't afford it. They, were, mm -hmm. they weren't well off at all. And then he, he, he um, managed to become principal medical officer of health for the whole of Sierra Leone when he was 26. Wow. Which is quite a, quite a feat, considering it's had a population of two million more than Scotland. Mm. I told him I wanted to be a writer, and he said to me, um, the world will always need lawyers, it will always need doctors, and it will always need engineers in order to get you to the lawyer and the doctor. But there are very, very few people who make it, he thought I wasn't to be a journalist, in journalism, and then he went, goodness gracious, you might end up working for the Lenethical Gazette. And the way he said it, 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 that's the local paper where I live, and he said it with horror in his voice. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, and I went to university and then um, I applied for dentistry and I applied for law. And it so happened that then the university accepted me one week before Glasgow accepted me for dentistry. Hence, I became a lawyer. And, uh, I don't think I'd come to you as a dentist. So sure. <laughs> I don't think I'd come to me as a dentist either. No, yeah. <laughs> um, having said that, once I, once I became, I mean, and I just, I fell in love with, with criminal defence. And I think there is a mm. certain, and I think you have this too. I think, I think any, every, every good lawyer does, is you have a sense of um, fighting for the underdog. I think mm. that's what, and I think and somehow, and we'll come to this, I'm sure, but I think that to some extent, that happens and you know I think that the SAS people who are in that position but despite the fact that they may not know exactly why they're doing it you know the, the, all the political reasons I still think that they feel that they're doing it you know in order to protect the innocent yeah no they're not thinking it they're doing it to protect the guilty no I think I think they need that psychological justification as well um I've also got a line in there somewhere, haven't I, from Black's boss, who says that the guilty are as entitled to our protection as the rest of them. And no, the, the deluded are as entitled to our protection as the rest of them. Yes, that's right. Um, Frank, Frank, Frankie Towers says that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but, uh, to, to me, um, he's, he's a... He, he was a very, very interesting character. I don't want any, any spoilers, but very interesting character indeed. I think he, he was someone who literally never questioned his, his own his, his beliefs um, for, for, for reasons which will become evident to anybody who reads the book. But, you know, un, unlike Black and unlike others, I think he, um, he was a different kettle of fish. A different yeah, well, it, it, interestingly, he was the only character that my publisher took issue with initially. He's oh. um, Freddie Towers, Colonel, retired Colonel, uh, Black's former commanding officer in the book he's he's five foot five a bundle of energy and his nickname in the army was fireballs because he was completely totally uncompromising yeah um and um yeah my publisher sort of said maybe rein him in a bit maybe he's not quite accurate and I thought no I, I know people like that Yes, no, no, it, it, it's this, this is the thing that drives me mad, this raining in, pulling him in, you know, you, you, so having had, I mean, I've written this, you know, a, a large number of scripts for River City and some East Enders and Taggart, and um, it, but the notes, when you get notes from an editor asking you to, to rein somebody in, it's, it's infuriating. I'm not saying it's not ne sometimes necessary for what can go out on, you know, for what goes out on TV at, at certain hours, but you know, you have to make, telling the truth, you know, showing the cat that these people do exist. And the, 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 if, if you try to stop them coming out here, they'll come out somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's like pressure. You know, if you, if you repress, as you say, you, you repress it here. Look, 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 look for instance, as I, as I say, I'm jumping back again, but look at the, the political correctness just now that comes out. Yeah. Gun crime in the streets of, of Scotland and England and, and, and knife crime has never been higher. Yeah. You know, you, you know, we, we worry about calling somebody by a name or by a, a pronoun and at the same time, um, violence escalates. And, and I think that by not confronting, by not bringing out characters as they are, um, yeah. then we, then we, then we, 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 we uh, we betray the whole 
we betray the whole, the, the whole what society actually is. Just very, very quickly, and I'm rabbiting on here. I put River City. Uh, I put uh, Jimmy Two Guns script into um, a particular channel. I won't say which one it is. And I got a note back from <laughs> I got a note back from the person who'd read it. Somebody about twenty two year old with a degree from Leeds University or something in social science or some nonsense. Anyway, she she um, she had written and then an email said that she'd read it, but unfortunately she didn't find any of the the characters particularly warm. Mm. And and I thought, well, sweetheart, well, you know that sounds terribly uh, sexist. Sorry, I thought, what what world are you living in? You know, didn't find them very, she didn't like them very much. And, you know, well, no, people who um, do the kind of things in Jimmy Two Guns perhaps have a, a, quite an unlikable side. But, but that side has got to be shown or else, or else you're just there. Uh, well, that's, you know, this is, this is the point of creativity. This is the point of fiction is to try and tell the truth with the greatest possible clarity that you can. And if, if television drama is, is not prepared to, to go there, then what's it doing? It's just participating in one great big lie for, forever. But, yeah. but the shows that hit on an element of truth are the ones that go global and become fantastically successful, um, usually despite the executives. But anyway, that's... <laughs> I mean, but look, look at your, your um, uh, Gordon Newman, you know, who, who, you're very, a member of your family, really. I mean, when he brought out, was it Law and Order, all these years ago, and you see these cops sitting in pubs drinking, you know, whiskey and discussing how big a bung, of, you know, the bribe they're going to take. And I mean, hmm. it, it, there were questions in Parliament, were there not? I mean, they were, oh, cracking, yeah, yeah. They were cracking up. And now that's nothing, you know, because, because people like Gordon Newman had the guts to push the envelope to, to do it. And I mean, nowadays, if you wrote about a bent cop, nobody would bat an eyelid. They're all bent. Half of them are bent. I mean, you know, you know, I've, I've had uh, many an experience with the police, both on, on both sides of the fence, the literal fence, no, no. <laughs> along with the wire on the top of it. And then, you know, that always makes me laugh. The idea of a few bad apples in the, a few bad apples in the barrel. The barrel's <laughs> really rotten all the way through. But anyway, I'm, I'm jumping off. Let's um. Let's talk about how you and I ended up leaving the law, right? Because right. my journey in the law was not very long, you know, four or five years or something. Um, I originally intended to be a civil lawyer. I never wanted to go anywhere near crime. Um, that's a long story. But I ended up in this criminal law chambers. And in, in England, you've got to both prosecute and defend. Um, and what I discovered was that um, defending people was no problem because every time you met someone in the cells beneath the court, they had a, a you know, usually a, tra a fairly tragic story to tell. Yep. I mean, you could trace, trace their life back to their beginning and see exactly why they'd ended up in, in trouble. And many of them were young, most of them are young men. Um, and it was very hard not to feel sympathy for about 99% of them on a, on a purely human level, you know, the law aside. Um, and I got very upset actually with the way that the, the law, the criminal law, particularly put young teenagers through the prison system. And you saw them a couple of years later and they were just a bit older, a bit more damaged. Um, the system had done nothing for them when actually what they needed was removing from their circumstances and probably some time and attention and money spent on them, quite frankly, to try and show them that there's another life. Anyway, that was defending. Prosecuting, I found really difficult, um, just on a purely a nice guy. <laughs> emotional level. Um, even people that, you know, deserve to be prosecuted. I found it tough. I couldn't tell you why. It, it, I mean, it's a job that needs to be done. You and I would agree on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but at that time, I could probably do it better now. But at that time, it, it, it wasn't working for me. I remember... Um, even prosecuting a drugs mule who'd come into Heathrow Airport with six kilos of heroin stitched into his suitcase. It should have been open and shut. I still managed to lose that case. <laughs> um, the open and shut, that's the, the, the metaphor there, but anyway. Yeah, that's right. And um, yeah, it also became apparent to me that the, the criminal law is 
I, I called it civilized combat. You know, um, it's it's kind of like a bloody box. Sometimes yeah. not quite civilized. Yeah, but I know what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, and um, it was kind of like I thought. Well, it, this, this is this is always going to go on. It's got to go on. But I'm not really the guy to be in the middle of it. I worked out that I was actually far more interested in the in the criminals and their stories and why they ended up there. And I started writing stories about them and then sort of moved into TV, not intending to leave the law, but sort of 25 years slipped past and I've not gone back. <laughs> um, but you had a slightly more, um, you know, abrupt end to your legal yeah, career. Yeah, I, I acted as a defence solicitor in Scotland for those in England. In Scotland, solicitors do far, far more court work in, in the criminal courts than they do in England. In England, they tend to, he have a solicitor, he has the client, he gets a barrister. And in Scotland, our sheriff courts, we have, we have, we have the district court, which is a, a magistrate, a local councillor, um, usually with, you know, the IQ of a rocking horse. And he has a, a, a lawyer as his, um, as his clerk. Mm. If he was any good, a lawyer would, would never be a clerk in the district court. So you're, you're up against it right from the get-go. But anyway, we have that. And then we have in Glasgow, anyway, stipendary magistrates. I don't know if they're still going. I think they are. Which means that they get paid for yeah. being, they actually are lawyers. And they can only sentence somebody. Um, I think it was up, I, I, since I did, I, I stopped in 1999. But the, um, they, they can only sentence up to three months. It's quite funny, actually, because when shoplifters, especially when drug addicts, a lot of young girls who were shoplifting for, for drugs, they would deliberately carry a little piece of cannabis in their pocket or purse or on their person because the district court stipendary magistrates who were absolute animals, they, they couldn't, they, they weren't allowed to deal with drugs cases. So these girls would deliberately carry just a little bit of hash so that if apprehended, they would go straight to the sheriff court where you would you, you, you have a much more, well, a judge who is more powerful but probably going to be far more lenient than the person. Listen to the evidence. Um, and I, as I say, I am. Um, I, I I acted for for a great many clients, uh, including a great many pe uh, people who were um, um, organised with an organised crime. And um, I, I suppose my, 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 I often you're completely right in saying that. It's a job that has to be done. Judges have to be there. Prosecutors have to be there. Um, I, it just, I, I have no problem with a judge and I have no problem with a prosecutor, but I have huge problems with hypocrites. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, I would like to think that I'm not one. I mean, we all are in our life to some extent, but I mean, I know prosecutor for schools personally who take drugs, who, who snort cocaine, who take smoke hash, take speed, take ecstasy. Um, I know sheriffs who do the same, and even up to the high court. And some of it comes out in my book, and will come out even more maybe in book two, um, if that, when, that gets, when that comes out. But anyway, and what gets me is, is the hypocrisy of these people. They feel, I mean, it's a little bit like, and I'm going off at a tangent here, but look at the the, 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 the chief medical officer just recently, you know, the other day there, mm. stay inside, wash your hands. By the way, I'm going down to bone house to see my husband. You know, you know, it's the, it's the sort of, it, it, the law, it applies to you, but it doesn't apply to me. Mm. And that's what I hated. One very brief story I think I've mentioned to you before was a young girl who was, had been a prostitute, she was what we call it, on the game in Glasgow Green. And she was locked up in the kind of, in, in the cells in the sheriff court waiting to go up for some sort of for some charge of soliciting and she discovered for the first time that the older prostitute in the same cell as her was in fact her mother wow now that person had stolen an article the, 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 the girl uh, who met her mother there very very shortly because they were parted moments after for court that girl was accused of stealing a, a an ornamental like a garden gnome or some garden mm -hmm. ornament and the sheriff in particular on the bench, I can't remember his name. I don't know if you remember the, the, the advert for the flu and the cold. There were these big, uh, there was a big lanky thing and, and, and an ascot powder came down and stood in his head. Sheriff would oh. remarkably like him. Okay. Sheriff, I remember him being a big long drink of water. 
But anyway, he'd been, he was obviously useless as an advocate, so they made him a sheriff. They bumped him up because he was, he'd obviously they gave him something to live on. And anyway, mm -hmm. he, was the, he was the judge. And he locked this girl up for three months. Yeah, yeah. Three months in prison due to her record for, you know, trying to sell her body was what she was doing. That's what, and then she was, but she was, but she was lifted on that because she was, there was a warrant out for her for stealing the other thing. Yeah. But, you know, and to me, I always felt myself to be on the side of the angels. Mm. But mm. I'm not painting a great picture of myself. What happened with me was that I, um, I acted for, as I say, I got, um, I was very involved in, in with, with clients. Uh, I was very, very close to a particular family and um, nothing to do with that family, I may say, though the papers say it was everything to do with, with nothing to do with them. Um, I was, and I won't go into the reasons why, but I was um, found in possession of two handguns and ammunition and I was arrested by a SWAT team helicopter police armed police. It was a bit like when I looked out the window and I just saw the lines of police. Yeah. Did you have the red dots on you? Red dots all over me. Come mm. out, hands up. And um, I'd remembered, funny you should talk about, talking about the SAS, I'd remembered listening to somebody from the SAS mm -hmm. on the radio, on the car one time on the way to work. And he'd said that he had been speaking, he'd been asked to train some of these officers. Yeah, yeah. Police officers. And he said that they were the most unfit people ever to be given firearms. The first question that they asked him was, how many people have you killed? What's it like to kill somebody? And he said, he was, he was, one, he was one of the, he was, um, he, as I say, he'd been in the SES, he said they were like children. And so when I saw the red dots all over me and uh, was told to kneel on the ground through a loud hailer, boy, I knelt on the ground all right, because these guys, they're more, they're more scared than you are. You know? I was going to say, I went to watch them um, for another project I'm doing at the moment. I went to watch some police firearms training the other week. And the protocols have changed a bit because of terrorism and the number yeah. of guns in circulation. I would be very concerned that if that happened to you now, you would be shot. Dead. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they were, the, 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 uh, the, it was bad enough then. But anyway, that, um, what happened there was I... Uh, I was in prison. I, I went. I, I was. I was convicted um, by a jury, and uh, I. My my, my defence was that I had been given the guns to hand in mm. by a client, and that's still my defence. However, the jury um, refused. It didn't believe it. And the jury came from a, a part of Scotland called around right about the Hart Hill area, which is a very Protestant sort of area. Right. And when my name was read out, James Johnson, Francis McIntyre, uh, I think they had they found me guilty before they'd even finished off reading the indictment. But the um, the the one one of the jury, in fact, fell asleep for the whole three days of the trial, and woke up at the end, and yet the, the verdict was still unanimous. And mm -hmm. when they were asked whether any mercy should be shown, they, they came back with a resounding no. So anyway, for, for possession of the two firearms and some ammunition, two pistols, um, in, a, in a locked drawer of a locked garage in a locked house, they gave me three years. I understand from a, a good friend of mine who's from South Africa that the punishment in South Africa for the same offence would be, uh, you would find a, a hundred rand, which is about 20 quid or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But anyway, I, I, I was... Um, that was the end of my, I mean, I could go on, that, that, that was then, I was locked up for, for, the, for the three years. And then um, I, uh, spent about a, I spent a year in prison in the, in the main jail. And then they put me out to um, a, an open prison, which they have to do um, after a year. They, they had wanted me to turn informer in the prison. They would have made things very easy for me and I refused to do that. So they made it as hard as they possibly could. Kept me in for 12 months sent me off to the open prison and I thought a joke, I made a, a wooden gun in the prison workshop. If you ever go to prison, Matthew, I really hope you don't, <laughs> don't make a wooden gun in the workshop because they find it not at all funny. What they, did it look like, uh, this wooden gun? Yeah, they didn't like that. They, they said to me, you could have taken this gun and you could have painted it black and used it to escape. I said, it's an open prison, I could have got the bus if I wanted to escape. It'd been a lot simpler. But anyway, they carted me back to the main prison, finished my sentence there. And it was the head of the family, of the, 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 the organised family, who was, who, picked, who was best man at my wedding that very day I got out of prison. 
Mm. Um, he picked so you up. Picked me up. Yeah, well, my brother picked me up, and then he brought me home. And then from my home to to get married the same morning, um, my friend, who's now unfortunately no longer with us, um, he had a big stretch limo arranged, and he took me there. I um, I had appealed the matter to the Law Society, and I had a tribunal hearing with about seven members of the. Um, some, I'll, I'll cut to this because I don't want to use all, all this time, but seven members uh, on this disciplinary hearing and they, after hearing my, my case, they decided to admonish me and let me back into the profession. However, the Law Society, for the first time in its history, the Law Society appealed against the Law Society. Oh, wow. And um, they, went, they, they brought the case in front of Lord uh, McCluskey, um, who heard the case. Lord McCluskey's daughter was forever getting arrested for drugs, but she never did a day in jail, as far as I can remember. However, um, Lord McCluskey, who's, um, who's, a, who's no longer with us either, mm. um, he um, decided that the Law Society should get another kick at the ball. Mm -hmm. And so they, I had to appear in front of them again. And as I was entering into the, the court, in, into the Advocates' Library, where they were hearing, this was after I got out of prison, Patrick Wheatley, now a sheriff, perhaps retired, it was Lord Wheatley's son, very, very nice guy, very pleasant man, came up to me and said to me, they've stitched you up, you know that, don't you? I said, oh, I was expecting it, Pat. And when I went in, there were five past presidents from the Law Society. Okay. Everyone who knew Noah when he wore shorts, um, and they decided that they would uh, strike me off. But God's been good. I was no sooner that that happened than I was offered a Taggart and River City and... Um, East End, right. yeah. When, you, when you've been in prison, there are not many options for employment, are there? Straight after, right. so writing right. writing was a good break. Writing was a good break. Prisons are, are, are very, unless you've been there, it's very hard to explain. Prisons are a place where if you don't take drugs, they test you for right. drugs to make sure that they don't find any drugs, and then they can show that there's a high rate of uh, non-drug taking. If you're mm. a big drug taker, then of course they don't test you because they don't want to show that the drugs are being brought in and the drugs are being brought in left, right and centre. They're, they're brought in by staff mm. and they're brought in by other ways, which I don't want to go into because I don't want to be accused even at this stage of being a grass. Yeah, right. But then um, the, there's no shortage in there. In fact, yeah. if, you ever, if, you, if you wanted to get into drugs, I suppose prison's probably the best place to go. Yeah, that's always fascinating, isn't it? We can we can't. Those of us who haven't been in don't know how that all works. How there's how there can be so much drugs, but presumably it just keeps the whole pressure. Well, from, yeah, um, off the system. Yes, and officers pretend they don't know what's going on, but I mean, you'd have to literally mm. be blind and deaf mm. not to know what's going on. I remember uh, one instance, <laughs> one instance when somebody had obviously um, got um, a packet of drugs and set them to their bottom. And there was um, a group of guys from, from Fife and, in a cell with the door half open, 45 degrees open. Mm. And they had the guy upside down, stripped to the waist, four of them, holding him with his bottom pointing towards the ceiling and a huge big empty plastic bottle with a big pen stuck into it, cell tape to make a sort of a, and they were flushing his bottom out, giving him a, you know, um, <laughs> what do you call it? I forget me. An enema to flush out the drugs. Ask the prison officer what past the door. Now, if you if you ha if you don't notice, there are five guys in a cell, one of who's standing on his head with a bottle rammed up his backside. Uh, then you're not really doing your job too well. Hey, that, that, that would make a good scene in a TV drama. Actually, we've got to use that at some point. Yeah, 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 indeed. When we, when we get Jimmy Two Guns made. Oh God um, willing. But you've said to me. Um, on a number of occasions, that the when you went to prison, um, the people that stood by you, that came to visit you, that looked after your family, were not your middle class friends. No, no, not at all. They, um, I think that they were very, very. There were one, two. I could count on three fingers the lawyers who contacted me when I was in there. One was Roy Harley, who was a, a very nice, a nice guy, and. Um, and uh, there was another older gentleman and maybe another couple who sent me a couple of books, etc. But I received something like 350 cards, mm. letters, wishes, mm. goodwill, 
and they were all from what people would call criminals. They were all from the underworld. And mm. uh, apart from my mother, who wrote to me a great deal, <laughs> but um, they, they were all from the, from the underworld. And money was put into my property mm. uh, by members of both sides of the Irish question, if you put it that way. Right. Um, and uh, no, there was a great deal of loyalty. Far more loyalty in that world, I can tell you, than the world of TV or yeah. writing TV where it's a completely cutthroat business. But, yeah, people, uh, don't, people don't understand how that works. You're just hired and fired at will. There's no certainty. Uh, you can even be fired halfway through writing a script if, if people don't like it. Well, indeed. I mean, yeah. I mean, I know perhaps I shouldn't say this, but I'll say it anyway because I've made a life out of saying things I shouldn't say. I wrote for that show, which we just discussed, for 14 years. I'm the longest serving writer on that show. Hmm. And then I was halfway through a script in 2016 at Christmas time, which the producer made a complete mess of and changed. I was having to rewrite it at, oh goodness, knows how many times to please this person who hadn't a clue what they're doing. And then um, eventually I got, I got told by somebody who had just joined the crew, the produ a, a producer who hadn't been working for 12 years. This person had had a job for 12 years emailed me to say that he'd read my script and unfortunately I didn't have what it take, what it took to be a writer for the show, despite the fact I was the longest writer, uh, serving writer over a 14 year period and this person had been there for six weeks. Yeah, it sounds that, very typical. That's what it's yeah. like. I, mean, I, don't, I don't say that with any bitterness. No. Because, no. You know, it's, um, it's just the way it goes. It's the way the, the cookie crumbles. So, um, this um we've gone off here we've gone off yeah we've gone off tangent but i want to come back to, you, to your prison experience yeah it's 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 always interesting how people change you know um i'm i'm a great one for forgiveness and when people have served their time that is it i hate it when people have served their time and they're still prevented from getting jobs or you know they're, they're still tarred with the brush of their past i think there's got to be a moment um, where you forgive someone and put things in the past. Um, I think as a society, we're really bad at doing that. You know, yeah. um, Christianity's founded by you know St. Paul, who was a, a persecutor. I mean, he he transformed, for That's example. Right. Uh, we've got a culture that was founded um, on that idea of forgiveness and and the potential for dramatic personal transformation um do you feel like you went through any great transformation as a result of your experience i think i to take to take your first point about about um having paid your dues as it were had i been a joiner or a brickie or an accountant i suppose or whatever i could have come out and gone straight back to it mm. as a criminal defense lawyer i had no client's account okay i didn't have a client's account and I had never, even under police questioning, had I given any information about guns or anything like that at all. So I had never given away any confidence. I had never betrayed my confidentiality as a solicitor. I had never stolen a penny off a client. I wasn't in a position to steal it. We didn't have a client's account because we were a purely criminal, criminal law firm. So what was, the, what was the reason for me not being able to, they, they, they took my, I mean, I, 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 that was the only skill I had, was a lawyer, a defence lawyer. They took that away from me. They didn't care. I mean, and why? I mean, what, the possession of the two guns, there was no question of it being, there was, I wasn't found guilty of using them, harming anybody, threatening, and they tried to do all that, but that all fell by the wayside because they made it up to begin with. But the point I'm making is, what was I meant to do? And when I, I was actually sitting in a, a waiting room after I'd got out of prison and I was approached in connection with another matter, a death of a friend of mine who'd been shot to death. And then the serious crime squad approached me and they said, it's just as well you got the jail, far too many people were getting off. And that was a very, very honest explanation as to what happened and why it happened. You know, they could easily, there was one other solicitor ever to have been done with what I was done for, that I know of in modern days. 
And his name, his second name, in fact, was, I won't tell you his first name. Well, his name was James Wright. I'm James McIntyre. Mm-hmm. And Wright was a name that when, when the clans were all uh, banned from using their, their, their Highland names, uh, McIntyre means son of the carpenter. So a lot of yeah. them took the name Wright as in a shipwright, or a, you know? Okay, yeah, yeah. Funny that the two people were, all, were both of more or less the same name. And this gentleman was, um, he's now dead, God rest him, I understand, some time back, was caught with a gun and a son-off shotgun, which he had carried continually in his briefcase for a period of 18 months with the purpose of using them. That's, some, he, that's a big briefcase. Yeah, he carried them for all that time. And his and yet they took him to the they took him to the sheriff court, fined him three hundred pounds, and he was allowed to practice again. Take that to mine. Mines were when I had them in my possession, it was proved for about a period of forty minutes. They were in a locked drawer in a locked cabinet, in a locked garage, in a locked house, and I get three years. I'm not being bitter. I'm just saying maybe maybe he wasn't a very good lawyer, so they were quite happy to let him oh, out. Oh yeah. So the, what you're saying is that you were so good at getting people off, you had got so many people off serious I'm, offences. I'm going, yeah, I'm they, going wanted, they wanted you out of the way. I, I, I have no doubt about <laughs> that. Absolutely none. And neither of any of my clients, as right. far as, as far as any changes concerned in me. I would love to say there was a change, but no, I don't think so. There's an old Irish song about, you know, the, the, when they took them away to Botany Bay. A rebel I came and I'm still the same, is one of the lines. Um, what I would like to say, and it sounds a bit corny, and what I did was obviously illegal, even though I did take them off, whether I took them off a client to keep them and hand them in or not. As, as, you know, as obviously the jury didn't believe that, whether it's true or not. Isn't isn't for for discussion just now, but for whatever reason, I, I've al- I've always found that God has seen me through, and I have had a belief in God. And people say, "Oh, what a hypocrite! What a hypocrite!" Well, maybe I am a hypocrite there, but I firmly believe that God saw me through that. If I can just say one thing, I was offered by friends of mine in that world. How could I say it? They offered to drastically reduce the evidence against me. Right, okay. By doing something, which would have involved somebody um, somebody not, not going to court. And I, ref- and I refused that. I, 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 I was very grateful for the offer, and, um, and it was very well intentioned, and I'm sure would have been executed, to use the word <laughs> in a different fashion. Um, you know, for my benefit, but I declined it. And I firmly believe that by declining that and letting God, as it were, have his way, that he rewarded me. I'm happier now than I was before I, I was in prison. And through no fault, through no, uh, not, not thanks to the law society or the police or anybody else, you know, they can all go to hell as far as I'm concerned. But the, the, the fact that God had a, a um, you know, a, a a design, as it were, for me. Mm. I, I, I went to mass and helped the priest every day in prison, and it reminded me of that in the film where, um, in, what's his name again, Ed de Valera is saying mass with the priest when he, when he was in prison. But the, as I say, I, I got out, and, now, and I've never been happier, and God has blessed me with, with, with my writing career, now with my book, with my family, and I think, to be truthful, had I carried on in the vein in which I had been and not been arrested, supposing that jury had come back with a not guilty. Yeah, so I was going to ask you, what would have happened to you? Be, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. I would have taken that, because I know me. I think to know yourself is quite important. I know me. And I would have carried on in what was a fairly destructive lifestyle. Mm. You know, mm. or maybe... You know, I was in a world where there were, there were plenty of drugs in the same way as the television world's full of drugs as well. But there were drugs, there were other temptations of the flesh. And there, were, there was um, your ego getting bigger and bigger. And the more you get away with, the more you push, the more you try to get away with. And I have no doubt that, the, that I, think, I, think it says in, in, I think it says in the book of Daniel, what man intended for evil... God intended for good. That's what my mother says anyway. My mother prayed that I'd be put away. 
That's interesting. So my, my mother prayed that that I, that I would be brought up short. I'm not saying she said, please send me to prison, but she certainly asked God to, 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 to draw me up short. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. So you you really think that it was it was divine intervention that got you into prison? So, yes, and saved, I believe, saved your life. Yeah, I believe that. Yes, and yeah. and, and I, I think everybody. I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, because I, I don't want to sound like a hypocrite. Since then, I've been in I've been in trouble. Since then, dearie me, I've had a number of convictions since getting out of prison. Um, all I may say, acting in self defence, but the. Right. the the courts never see it that way. They, they always think they always think that the winner is the baddie. But anyway, but that, that aside, I'm not trying to paint myself as a saint in any in any way. But you, you know, um, I certainly think that in life we are all determined to do things our way. Yeah, yeah. Determined to do things our way, and I think that God has a way. And this is sounding terribly kind of oh dear, what's this? What's he gone about now? But God has a has a plan for us all. I know that sounds terribly like it all come right at the end and what about the starving children in Africa? What's God's plan for them? I don't know is the answer to that. Yeah. But I think that, you know. Um, it's, well, it's funny you should say, I, I mean, I had a very different experience, but I've never really talked about it to anyone, actually. Um, I'll tell you about it. Um, I was very unhappy when I was a, a young barrister. I was beset with, psychological problems and you know crippling anxiety um sort of stage fright sometimes before going into court for certain cases i couldn't kick it um i had belief i had faith so I used to pray about it you know pray for guidance i remember you know even writing little prayers on my blue legal notebook sometimes in very pressured situations I was fine when I was all square with my conscience. Um, and then I was involved in a prosec big prosecution case as junior counsel. I was doing something, I think, reading a document out to the court and I dried up for some reason. I can't put my finger on at all. And that was the moment I knew I couldn't actually carry on in that profession. I thought I've literally been stopped dead mm -hmm. and i had been going for 15 years absolutely determined to go down this route but it was completely wrong mm -hmm. on, on some fundamental level you know i was i was meant to be leading a, a different kind of life altogether creative life and then and then the moment i became a writer everything sort of changed um but i was praying all the time when I was feeling pretty desperate. And sometimes the results are, are not what you expect them to be. And you don't even realize till years down the line, um, what's actually happened. Well, then, so I was taken to Glasgow uh, High Court for sentence after I was convicted in Edinburgh High Court. Um, the judge had, uh, the, despite the fact that I had a business to run and I had been found guilty of far, far lesser crimes than the ones I had been uh, originally charged with. I, mean, I had been originally charged with nine charges. This was only now one charge of possession, two charges of possession of firearms and ammunition. Anyway, the, the, he decided not to give me bail in order to put my house in order. Um, I don't know if he thought I was going to do, fly the country or something. But he reminded me in custody. And when I got to Glasgow, high court um, and was sentenced there. The only thing that, I mean, I, and I expected a longer sentence, to be honest, after what I've, I've been convicted. And the only, the thing that really annoyed me that day wasn't getting the three year sentence. It was in fact that when I got the sentence, and he said, James McIntyre only gave me some sort of spiel about being disgusted as an act. I can't remember what the judge said. I was con wasn't con particularly concerned. He wasn't a very nice man anyway. And then um, he, he, he sentenced me to three years. And I turned round to my then girlfriend, now my wife, who was at the back of the court with my late father. And I gave her a wave and I blew her a kiss because I was quite relieved with the sentence. 
if you get, if you do if you get a sentence of three years or less, you do half that sentence if you behave yeah. yourself. Not that I behave myself, but if you behave yourself. And if it's over three years, then you do two thirds. So there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. so, the, the, you know, I realised I was going away, but relief swept over me. I turned around, blew her a kiss, and she waved back to me, and I went down the stairs. However, it was reported in the press that McIntyre slumped in the dock when he received his sentence. That really, really annoyed me because of the fact that they, they, they attempted at the last, just to take that last piece of dignity away from me. Mm. You know, if I had been a child molester, they would have put down that I had showed no remorse. Even if I'd collapsed sobbing in the dock, they would have written I showed no remorse. And what really annoyed me further than that was that the person who wrote that, the journalist, so-called journalist who wrote that, wasn't in court that day. I know that for a fact. Yeah, that's not a great story. I, also, I, I also know for a fact it's who it was. So I'll leave that there. Hmm. Well, and, and then, um, of course, you did your, what, well, about 18 months in prison, didn't you? 18 months. One year in the, as I say, in the, in the main prison. And, um, and then the open prison for a few, couple of weeks until I unfortunately made the, the toy gun or the, the, the wooden gun. Is that, you, is that how you got your name? Because um, well, everybody well, knows. Well, yeah. I got done with the. I got done for the possession of the two guns, hmm. and I was after the year. As I say, after the third of your sentence, the duty bound to send you to an open. I went to the open, made the pretend gun. Um, I was only there for a short time. I was. I was. Got, I was due to get it out at Christmas for five days because it was an open prison, but I did it before Christmas. I managed to get myself carted back in chains, much to my wife's annoyance, I may say. And um, as I came back into the prison, somebody on the, on the second flat, there are in, in Stockton Prison, Edinburgh, there are three flats, ground flat, first flat, second flat. And I think Berlin has four, I think Liverpool has four as well, but anyway, there are three in Edinburgh. And somebody in the second flat shouted down, hey, Jimmy Two Guns is back. And the name just stuck. Yeah. And it's been a sort of nickname since then for the last and, um, odd years. And of course, we've written a, a pilot for a TV series by that name. We have. Uh, which remains unproduced, uh, I think, 12 years after we wrote it. 12 years later, yes. It's still. We're it's, it's, get it. I've given it, as you know, we've given it to people who've had great things to say about it. Mm. Um, Several people have given us great compliments. But we've had, I've had a few, including the one I told you about, about the lady, the young girl who said that she didn't find any of the characters particularly warm. Mm. But then, you know, she probably had the life experience of a butterfly anyway, so I, I, I doubt she'd have met any character like that. Well, look, we'll, I, th I think what we ought to do is um, meet again and have another chat in a few days' time, James. And um, we, can, um, we can touch on your life after you came out of prison and your adventures in television, my adventures in television, because we don't actually often get the inside track on what goes on in this crazy business. So no, indeed. Yeah, it'd be good I, fun to exchange stories. That would be great. I'd really enjoy that. I'm, um, are you doing anything particular just at the moment? Are you started on anything new? Yeah, well, I've got two TV projects that I'm, um, that I'm working on. One is actually a commission from BBC One, so I should be writing that script at the moment, a pilot episode. And um, the other one is slightly more speculative, but I got some interest from uh, a broadcaster, so I'm writing another episode of that. So these are two brand new things. So this year for me is um, the end of Keeping Faith, which has taken up about five years of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, the publication of that book which has been going even longer so it's all all a blank page at the moment so it's quite daunting but it's also quite refreshing at the same time well if you're looking for any writers keep me in mind won't you ah sure will i'm and, busy uh, sorry carry on so we're going to talk television we're also going to talk um religion as well yes i'm i've just finished my book um Jimmy Two Guns of the Early Years. It's a way to the editors at the moment. To, uh, but I'm having a wee stab at a book which is called Get Off Your Knees, 
and it's I, I, I'm a Catholic convert. I think we just mentioned that before. Yeah. And then um, the big thing nowadays is ecumenicalism. You know that we all we all rejoice in the in the things we have uh, the, the same, rather than concentrate on on their differences. And I think that's true. But I'm not convinced ecumenicalism is is the is a great thing. Much to the chagrin of my local priest, who tells me that that's the, the way things are going these days. But I'm, I, my kind of belief, maybe it's just my temperament. Mm. My belief is if you have the truth, or if you believe you have the truth, why would you want to water it down? Why would you want, I mean, I'm not particularly interested. I'm not saying I know everything at all. I'm not, I'm not saying there are, not, there are not more than one, there's not more than one road to heaven. You can, I'm sure if you believe strongly enough, you can still stumble through those pearly gates. But uh, I'm not prepared personally to throw out dogmas, doctrines, devotions, just so we could all sit around the campfire holding hands singing Kumbaya. You know, I would, um, I would rather uh, concentrate on my own belief. Great. That's, I'll that's, a, nice, that's a nice big discussion. Um, yeah. There's a great deal of, in the in past, in the past, there's a great deal of um, criticism being put on the Catholic Church, especially just now, terrible time. Catholic mm. Church having because of this these disgusting paedophiles in the priesthood. But when one looks at the percentage you know, of it, there's the same percentage in any other organization, police force, army, any other religion, Muslim, anything. And it's just that the Catholic Church is the largest global entity in the world, and therefore it's easy to point the finger at. And so I think it's somebody it's time for someone, even as unworthy as myself, to stand up for her and say unapologetically what she believes. Okay, well, I'd be interested to have that discussion. I'm an Anglican, as you know, so we, we come from slightly different backgrounds, but let's have that chat next time. Indeed, let's do that. And in the meantime, your daughter's off to start work as a nurse, so I shall yes. be praying for her, and I hope it goes really well for her. That's and very good. I hope you guys all keep safe up there in uh, Lynn Lithgow, and we will um, see you. We'll we hope this time. Absolutely. And I will be remembering in our prayers your elderly um, in laws over in Northern Ireland. I understand they're not too well. And uh, we'll be remembering them in our prayers too. Thanks, James. See We're both sending incredibly holy, but uh, we'll be found out one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Till next time. Very soon. Cheers. Take care. I'll be right. Bye-bye.